So my last name is Owens. Um, I work at CodeStar, which is a Dutch consultancy. We do Scala projects. Uh, I've done Scala since about 2011 as a hobby, and since last year I started doing it professionally. I am indeed passionate about the equals method, so I have an open source project called Equals Verifier. Um, I'm maybe the only person in this room who does Scala for the day job and Java as a side project. <laughs> um, but today I will tell you about a Scala project I did at work last year. Um, so first I will give you some context. Uh, what was the project about? Then I will tell you a little bit about what we actually did, and then I will tell you the reactions uh, at the company. So, starting out, um, the project was at Rabobank. Rabobank is one of the four biggest banks in the Netherlands. They also operate uh, in, in different countries as well. And in the Netherlands, they are the largest supplier of mortgages. And this is actually what I'm going to talk about. Um, because they have this website where you can put in your information, like, I make this much money, uh, I have these debts, uh, how much, how big a mortgage can I get? Can I buy this house or not? And they have Java code to do these calculations, and they have become, over the years, basically unmaintainable, and it was time to do um, a partial rewrite. Uh, and they asked us to do this. So they had a couple of requirements. First of all, it should be easy uh, for developers to write and maintain these financial calculations, right? Um, not like the current situation where there were only a handful of people who understood the code. They wanted all the developers to be able to understand. And after we convinced them to try Scala, um, they said, well, Let's, let's go one step further. Can we also make it readable for the business analysts of the company so that they can do like preliminary code reviews, um, which they couldn't do with Java code because they simply don't speak the language. Uh, the final requirement should be obvious. Um, make a mistake and it costs a lot of money. So what we did was we started growing a DSL. And what I mean by that is that when I started this project and my colleague all, uh, of the same company, um, we didn't have a lot of experience with the domain. I didn't know a lot about mortgages. Well, he did, but I didn't. And it's actually pretty complicated stuff. There's law involved, there's economics involved, there's also Rabobank company policy. And these things all come together in uh, lots of calculations. The other thing that we were exploring was actually Scala itself, because as I said, I have been doing Scala a while, but I've never used Scala's DSL uh, capabilities. I haven't used the type system that much to give you an impression. I'm currently in chapter three or four of the Red Functional Programming book. Um, so that also means if I'm telling you something later in this talk and you say to yourself, hey, Jan is doing it wrong, uh, please come up to me afterwards and explain to me, because I want to learn. Okay, so this is the Eye of the Tiger montage part, where, we, where I tell you what, what we did. Um, first of all, I will give you an impression of the original Java code. Uh, this is actually not the real code, because Rabobank probably doesn't like it if I put trade secrets on a big slide. Um, but it's uh, an indication of what we were working with. Uh, so you can see lots of big decimals with uh, you know, the, the, the Java methods for adding and subtracting and doing things. And it's basically one big wall of text. It's kind of hard to see what's going on here. So the first thing we did was just translate it to Scala, one-on-one, -on -one, no tricks. Uh, the variables are, have the same names, the types are the same as they were in, in Java. And suddenly it becomes a lot more readable. And actually, when we did this, there was one thing that stood out to us. Uh, maybe you've already seen it on the slide. There is this 1200 number, and we didn't know what it meant. No idea, really. Um, we figured it out later on, and I will get back to it. 
So after that, uh, we started to add some, some Scala stuff to, to our code. And obviously, the, f the place to start was a case class of an uh, amount. Um, but if you write it down like this, um, you know, reading the code, you don't know, are these euros, are these dollars, are these kroner? You don't really know. Um, and to make it more accessible for uh, business analysts, for example, we added an implicit class to have a little fake constructor. Uh, that makes it read a little bit nicer. You can see that it's euros now. Um, and we actually looked at uh, Squant's uh, type level project. I don't know if it was at the time uh, to for, for a bit of inspiration, but they weren't that far along with financial stuff yet. So, but we did look at it a little bit. Um, okay, so afterwards we also made the constructor private um, so that you couldn't use the unreadable, so to speak, version. And then the real fun started with arithmetic. You need to be able to add and subtract, and that's pretty easy to do in Scala. Um, but then multiplication gets kind of weird, because if you have 10 euros and you will multiply it uh, with 2 euros, do you get square euros, right? That's, that makes no sense. Um, so we wanted to make sure that you could only multiply amounts with uh, big decimals, or at least numbers that don't have a unit. And we were able to do that by just adding some multiplication methods, one to the amount, and then we added an, uh, a, a decoration, uh, no, an uh, extension method, so to speak, for uh, big decimals. We have one for int as well, obviously. Uh, to make it more easy to work with. And then now we could write this. And this is, as you know, uh, valid uh, Scala test code. And we showed this to a business analyst, and he said, uh, what are those dots doing there? <laughs> so that means he could read the thing and understand what it said. Uh, he was just a little confused about the syntax. He didn't realize it wasn't English, it was Scala. So that was nice. That was a, a, a win. And we continued. We added a new concept, a percentage, uh, basically the same as the amount. Uh, we also wanted to add a, a nicely readable constructor and what is more obvious to a percentage than a percentage sign. But that one didn't work because uh, the line below, it tries to put the word should into the modulo operator. And then the parsing breaks down, and it doesn't even realize that we have this implicit class. So that didn't work, unfortunately. And we decided to just write out the whole word. Um, multiplication with uh, amounts and percentages should also work, because even though percent kind of has um, a unit, it's not really. It's just 1% is really. 0 0.01, right? So you should be able to multiply those together. And to do that, we just added a couple more multiplication methods. And we started to get lots of those um, because of all the different types that were involved. And this didn't really sit well with us, but we didn't really know how to fix it either at the time. Uh, but we found a solution later, which I will come back to. So if we look at the code, this is a snippet of the Scala code I showed you earlier. And you see that it has become a lot more type safe. So it's, it's harder to make mistakes like um, putting uh, a percentage in a, in, a, in a position where you expect an amount. So that's pretty basic stuff, but nice. However, we missed, uh, we, we, we lost something along the way, because this is also a snippet from uh, the, sh the code I showed you earlier. And suddenly, we couldn't do a sum over a list of amounts anymore, because uh, the sum method didn't support it. Um, and we didn't know how that worked at the time, so we looked at the type signature of uh, the sum method in the Scala APIs, and we found this, and we were confused, and then Little by little, we started to understand. We read the Neophytes guide uh, about type classes, and we figured out, hey, this is a, a type class. Um, 
So what is this numeric thing? It's actually a pretty simple trait. You can just implement it. So we figured, let's do that with our amount. It should be easy, right? But then we came back to multiplication. And the trait <laughs> requires you to implement a method with this signature. And we just discussed that the signature does not make sense. So that was a little sad. And we just put a, an exception there, because you know, what are you going to do? I did look around in uh, the sources of the Scala APIs. And it turns out that while plus was used several times, the times methods, I, I couldn't find any usages. So I think we get away with it. And now we can do incomes.sum again, which is what we wanted. And this may look like a, a small thing, but if you go to a business analyst and you say, well, I have a list of incomes and I want to sum them, he will understand. But if you say, I have a list of incomes and I will reduce them with the function underscore plus underscore, good luck. So that's how we discovered how type classes work. And then we figured, let's apply that to our multiplication thing. So as I showed you earlier, we had lots of multiplication uh, methods. And I showed you the amount type and the uh, percentage type. But we had actually a couple more as well in our code base. And they all had multiplication overloads. And it was, it was a mess. So we figured, with this new knowledge about type classes, we should be able to do it better. So we defined our own trait. Uh, we called it quantity. We had a multiplication method that followed the rules that, that we wanted. Like, you can multiply this thing only with a big decimal or something that amounts to a big decimal. So we implemented, for, uh, we implemented it for the uh, amount class. We also had an implementation for big decimal for convenience. And now we could add this method signature to our percentage with this implicit uh, EV parameter thingy. So to make sure that it only works if there is a quantity object in scope that is implicit. Um, and it turns out you can actually write it in two ways, which was a new thing for us as well. Um, and we took this to the other developers at Rabobank. So most of them uh, didn't know Scala or had maybe written or uh, read or heard about it. And we asked them, well, which, uh, which version do you prefer to read? Uh, I personally like the second one because it, it uh, communicates more clearly what I intended. Uh, so the type should be some sort of quantity. And that you implement that with a type class, I don't care. But you see it immediately in the place where you define what the type is. But most of the other developers said, well, I actually prefer the first one, um, because by, with the second one, there's lots of magic going on in the background. And I'm still pretty new to Scala. Um, so let's, let's just not go there right away. Um, yeah, so that's, we, we actually still went with the second one for our internals for the DSL code, because they only have to call it and not maintain it. Um, and we still, now that we have redefined our multiplication, we also have to make it commutative again. Um, and we implemented the multiplication on the percentage, but not yet for the, um, for the amount, or actually for anything that was a quantity. So we can make an implicit class and add that multiplication and make sure that it delegates to the percentage. And then we're done. And it works. So instead of having uh, loads of overloads, we now only have two multiplication methods, one in percentage, one in the implicit class. And that's all of it. And if we want to add a new type that supports this kind of multiplication, we just write uh, a new quantity instance for it, and we're done. So that was really nice. And then we found another cool trick. Because we wanted to also distinguish between yearly amounts and monthly amounts. I told you earlier about uh, mixing up a percentage and an amount, for example, and, and that would happen. But we spoke to a tester. And what happens even more often is that you get these two mixed up. And if you do, that too could cost a lot of money, obviously. 
Uh, so the testers were used to um, looking for this kind of thing. But if you can catch it at compile time, that's a lot better. So we started by defining a period, and it has a month and a year. And then we defined a per, uh, which has two uh, parameters. It has a value of I don't care what type, and it has a period. And we did have to add a multiplication again. Um, and we did use the first notation for the implicit, because otherwise you would have to restrict the t type for the whole per class, and we only wanted to restrict it for just this method. So there I went again with my preference for the other notation. But actually, this still had a problem, because if you write this out in a REPL, um, then you get the type. I actually did it wrong on the slide here, I'm sorry. You actually get this type out instead of this one. So you have to explain to the other developers what dot type means uh, in your code. And that was a pretty uh, awkward to explain to the developers, and then we had to go to the business analysts. So this was actually pretty easy to solve, fortunately. We just added some more boilerplate. Um, we deliberately used a month, uh, I mean a class and a val that have the same name with the same casing. Uh, so that people can just write the word month always with a capital letter, and then the compiler will figure out which one you need it. And now you do get the type that you wanted. So that's better. But the nice thing about Scala is that if you have a type with two type parameters, you can use an infix notation, and now suddenly you no longer have a type that you can show to a developer and he will understand. You can you have a type that you can show to anybody who speaks English, and they will understand. So for the business analysts, again, this was a great win. Um, and if you add an implicit class um, with a sort of constructor method, you can do that on the other side of the assignment uh, as well. So you can now have a type amount per year with a value 10 euro per year. Of course, um, if you put an amount, for example, in uh, this per object, um, you want to be able to access the methods on that amount. For example, we had a method round to whole euros. And if you would put it in a per, you couldn't access it anymore. So obviously, um, we needed a map function. And then we started using it in four expressions. So we needed a flat map function. Those were pretty easy to implement, actually. And suddenly, we had this monad on our hands, which we didn't expect. Of course, uh, PER still needs Im implementations for the numeric and the quantity. They're actually a little bit harder than the ones I showed you earlier. Um, but usually, when I give this talk, I have an hour. And now I have a little bit less. So I'll leave that one up to you. I think you can handle it. And if we look at a snippet of the code again, um, we suddenly see that uh, we have a, a difference between uh, well, di di a difference between the sorts of amounts, right? So the price of a house is still an amount, but my income is suddenly an amount per month, and you cannot mix those two up anymore. So in summary, we used a lot of implicit conversions, implicit classes to make fancy looking constructors. Um, we used implicit objects and implicit valves to make the type classes work. And we used uh, the infix notation to make things more readable. So what happened at Rabobank when we did that? Well, first of all, I want to show you the code one last time. So this was the Java code that we started with. This was the one-to-one -one translation of, uh, to Scala. And remember the 1200? Anybody figure out what, they, uh, what it could have meant? Sorry? Yes, exactly. And um, that, that's what we found out. It was just somebody trying to be clever. He said 12 per month of 12 months in a year and 100%. And they just happened to be together in the algorithm. And he probably figured, let's. Uh, save the runtime a few milliseconds of computing time. 
But the nice thing about our case classes was that we could uh, eliminate that magic number completely because now we had a percentage type which took care of the 100 and we had a period type which took care of the 12 and suddenly you can just divide uh, a percentage by the frequency of a period that something occurs within a year and you don't need to type those numbers again. So that, that's actually, uh, it makes it more easy to understand again. And actually the DSL contains much more than I just uh, uh, described. Um, I see that there is a word missing, uh, f fiscal boxes. I was going to say that's uh, this law thing in the Netherlands where you have two types of expenses and you, they get taxed differently. So we had support for that. Uh, and, and there were some other things as well. Um, but I'm not going to show them to you right now. So earlier I showed you this slide with our requirements. Uh, the question was at the end, well, did, did we meet those requirements? Did we achieve our goals? And we gave our code to some of the developers at Rabobank who weren't very skilled in, in Scala and they could pick it up pretty quickly. And by it, I mean the code that used the DSL. So we had written a financial calculation using the DSL that we created. And these developers were pretty easily able to uh, make modifications where they needed and basically understand the code. So that was, that was very good. However, the um, DSL itself still needs, you know, you, you have to have some Scala skill in order, in order to maintain the DSL itself. Uh, but that's already a big step up from the previous situation where you needed to have lots of knowledge and domain-specific knowledge and things that most developers actually didn't have to do the calculations themselves, let alone a DSL. And the fun thing is that uh, one of the guys maintaining uh, the Java code, he saw our work and he started to introduce uh, case class-like uh, objects in his code as well. Uh, for, for the amount, for example. For the uh, readability for the business, um, well, we, we showed them the code. They were able to read it and uh, understand what was going on and, uh, you know, point out certain mistakes that we made while uh, implementing their specifications. So that, that worked. Um, as for the correctness, um, well, we added all those type safety features. So lots of bugs aren't possible anymore that were possible in the Java implementation. Uh, but obviously, because Scala compiles to bytecode, uh, we could run it within our own test suite that we already had. Um, so we had to make a little bridge between the Scala API and the Java API, and we just ran our existing test suite, and it failed because indeed we made a mistake and we fixed the mistake and then it actually worked. So our code was at least as correct as the existing Java code. And that was also nice. But we still had to convince people because uh, we had this one stubborn architect who said, well, this is all nice and dandy, but can't we do this in, in Java as well, right? And of course you can make code in Java uh, that is better than the code that they had already. But if you do that, you either lose type, type safety or you lose readability. And because you're using big decimals, you're going to lose readability anyway. <laughs> and another thing was, isn't it easier to find uh, Java developers? So that, that was a reason for him to prefer Java. Um, but it turns out that it's actually pretty hard to find Java developers. It's also pretty hard to find Scala developers, but at least now you're uh, looking in two places for developers. So it's easier to find developers as a whole. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was actually the reasoning of the manager at Rabobank. That to be <laughs> to. But this wasn't even the most interesting thing that happened because uh, this whole DSL thing actually inspired a new project by a different group of developers. I spent some time with them before I 
unfortunately had to move on to another cool project. And they built this whole rule engine uh, that was based on top of uh, the DSL. Um, I apologize for the Dutch, we, they haven't translated it to English yet. But it looks kind of like this, and it is actually very close to what the uh, business analysts write. And now one of the business analysts actually started writing and, writing and committing code. And we have this, we, they have this commit game where if you do a unit test, you get a point and things like that. And after one sprint, he came in second. <laughs> so that was cool, right? Um, we wanted it to be readable for the business analysts, and they started writing it. So I guess um, that, that, that goal was achieved. And the nice thing is Rabobank allowed us to open source the thing, so it's, it's on GitHub if you want to see it. Again, it's all in Dutch. I translated it on the slides for you, but the, the, the code itself is mostly in Dutch. We are going to translate it, but um, we have to find time to do so. So that was my talk. Uh, are there any questions? I have two questions. First one, uh, how do error messages look like? And if you have analysts writing code now in Scala, what happens if that's, their code doesn't compile? Um, so the error messages, we didn't spend a lot of time on those, I have to admit. So they would look like uh, what you expect, I guess. Um, as for the business analyst writing code uh, at Rabobank, uh, the business analyst is actually part of the team, uh, of a scrum team. So um, whenever something comes up, he can just ask one of the developers on his team, and, and usually they will help out. Uh, Thank you. And the second question is, uh, did performance matter at all? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did you guys consider using uh, Joda money instead of uh, kind of like building your own amount uh, types? Um, we actually didn't consider that, to be honest, no. More questions? Okay, then, thanks. <laughs>